The Book of the Revelation of Jesus. The author of this book, which is not called Revelations, by the way, is named at the beginning. It was written by John, which could refer to the beloved disciple who wrote the Gospel and the letters of John, or it could be a different John, a Messianic Jewish prophet who traveled about and taught in the early church. Whichever John it was, he makes clear in the opening paragraph what kind of book he has written. He calls it, first of all, a revelation or apocalypse. The Greek word is apokalupsis, and it refers to a type of literature very familiar to John's readers from the Hebrew scriptures and from other popular Jewish texts. Apocalypse has recounted a prophet's symbolic dreams and visions that revealed God's heavenly perspective on history and current events so that the present could be viewed in light of history's final outcome. And John says this apocalypse is a prophecy, which means it's a word from God spoken through a prophet to God's people, usually to warn or comfort them in a time of crisis. By calling this book a prophecy, John's saying that it stands in the tradition of the biblical prophets and is bringing their message to a climax. And this apocalyptic prophecy was sent to real people that John knew. The book opens and closes as a circular letter that was sent to seven churches in the ancient Roman province of Asia. Now, seven is a meaningful number for for John. It's a symbol of completeness based on the seven-day Sabbath cycle in the Old Testament, and John has woven sevens into every single part of this book. Now, with this opening, John has given us clear guidance about how he wants us to understand this book. Jewish apocalypse is communicated through symbolic imagery and numbers. It is not a secret predictive code about the timing of the end of the world. Rather, John is constantly using these symbols that are drawn from the Old Testament, and he expects his readers to go discover what the symbols mean by looking up the text he's alluding to. Also, the fact that it's a letter means that John is actually addressing the situation of these first century churches. And so while this book has much to say to Christians of later generations, the book's meaning must first be anchored in the historical context of John's time, place, and audience. Which brings us into the book's first section, Jesus' message to the seven churches. John was exiled on the island of Patmos, and he saw a vision of the risen Jesus exalted as king of the world. And he was standing among seven burning lights. And John's told this is a symbol of the seven churches in Asia Minor that's been adapted from the book of the prophet Zechariah. And Jesus starts addressing the specific problems that face each church. Some were apathetic due to wealth and affluence. Others were morally compromised. Their people were still eating ritual meals and sleeping around in pagan temples. But others among the churches remained faithful to Jesus, and they were suffering harassment and even violent persecution. And Jesus warns that things are going to get worse. A tribulation is upon the churches that will force them to choose between compromise or faithfulness. By John's day, the murder of Christians by the Roman Emperor Nero was passed, and the persecution of Christians by Emperor Domitian was likely underway. And so the temptation was to deny Jesus, either to avoid persecution or simply to join the spirit of the Roman age. And Jesus calls them to faithfulness so that they can overcome or literally conquer. And Jesus promises a reward for everyone in these churches who does conquer. Each reward is drawn directly from the book's final vision about the marriage of heaven and earth. And so this opening section, it sets up the main plot tension that will drive the storyline in this book. Will Jesus' people endure? Will they inherit the new world that God has in store? And why is faithfulness to Jesus described as conquering? The rest of the book is John's answer. After this, John has a vision of God's heavenly throne room, and he describes it with imagery drawn from many Old Testament prophets. Surrounding God are creatures and elders that represent all creation and human nations, and they're giving honor and allegiance to the one true creator God who is holy, holy, holy. In God's hand is a scroll that's closed up with seven wax seals. It symbolizes the message of the Old Testament prophets and the sealed scroll of Daniel's visions. These are all about how God's kingdom will come here fully on earth as in heaven. But it turns out no one is able to open the scroll until John hears of someone who can. It's the lion from the tribe of Judah and the root of David. He can open it. These are classic Old Testament descriptions of the Messianic king who would bring God's kingdom through military conquest. Now, that's what John hears. But then what he turns and sees is not an aggressive lion king, but a sacrificed bloody lamb who's alive, standing there, and ready to open the scroll. Now, this symbol of Jesus as the slain lamb, this is crucially important for understanding the book. John's saying that the Old Testament promise of God's future victorious kingdom was inaugurated through the crucifixion 
crucified Messiah. Jesus overcame his enemies by dying for them as the true Passover lamb so that they could be redeemed. Because of the resurrection, Jesus' death on the cross was not a defeat. It was his enthronement. It was the way he conquered evil. And so this vision concludes with the lamb alongside the one sitting on the throne, and together they are worshipped as the one true creator and redeemer, and the slain lamb begins to open the scroll. It's a symbol of his divine authority to guide history to its conclusion. Which brings us to the next section of the book, the three cycles of seven. Seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. And each cycle depicts God's kingdom and justice coming here on earth as in heaven. Now, some people think that the three sets of seven divine judgments represent a literal linear sequence of events that either happened in the past, or could be happening now, or are yet to happen in the future when Jesus returns. But notice how John has woven all the sevens together. So the final seven bowls come out of the seventh trumpet and the seventh seal. And the seven trumpets emerge from the seventh seal. They're like nesting dolls. Each seventh contains the next seven. Also notice how each of the series of seven culminates in the final judgment, and they have matching conclusions. So it's more likely that John is using each set of seven to depict the same period of time between Jesus' resurrection and future return from three different perspectives. So the slain lamb begins to open the scroll's first four seals, and John sees four horsemen. It's an image from the book of Zechariah chapter 1, and they symbolize times of war, conquest, famine, and death. In other words, a tragically average day in human history. Then the fifth seal depicts the murdered Christian martyrs before God's heavenly throne, and the cry of their innocent blood rises up before God like smoke from the altar of incense, and they're told to rest because more Christians are yet to die. We're not told why, but we are told that it won't last forever. The sixth seal is God's ultimate response to their cry. He brings the great day of the Lord that was described in Isaiah and Joel, and the people of the earth cry out, who is able to stand? And then all of a sudden, John pauses the action with an intermission to answer that question. John sees an angel with a signet ring coming to place a mark of protection on God's servants who are enduring all this hardship. And he hears the number of those who are sealed, 144,000. It's a military census, like the one in the book of Numbers, chapter 1. There are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, pay attention. The number of this army is what John heard, just like he heard about the conquering lion of Judah. But in both cases, what he then turned and saw was the surprising fulfillment of those military images in Jesus, the slain lamb. So when he sees this messianic army of God's kingdom, it's made up of people from all nations, fulfilling God's ancient promise to Abraham. It's this multi-ethnic army of the lamb who can stand before God because they've been redeemed by the lamb's blood. And now they are called to conquer, not by killing their enemies, but by suffering and bearing witness just like the lamb. After this, the seventh and final seal is broken. But before the scroll is opened, the seven warning trumpets emerge and fire is taken from the inside incense altar. It symbolizes the cry of the martyrs and it's cast onto the earth, bringing the day of the Lord to its completion. Now, with the seven trumpets, John backs up and he retells the story again, this time with images from the Exodus story. So the first five trumpet blasts replay the plague sent upon Egypt, and then the sixth trumpet releases the four horsemen that came from the first four seals. But then John tells us that despite all these plagues, the nations did not repent, just like Pharaoh didn't in the Exodus story. So it seems that God's judgment alone will not bring people to humble repentance before him. Then John pauses the action again with another intermission. An angel brings the unsealed scroll that was opened by the Lamb. And just like Ezekiel, John is told to eat the scroll and then proclaim its message to the nations. Finally, the Lamb's scroll is open and now we will discover how God's kingdom will come here on earth. The scroll's content is spelled out in two symbolic visions. First, John sees God's temple and the martyrs by the altar, and he's told to measure and set them apart. It's an image of protection taken from Zechariah chapter 2. But then the outer courts in the city are excluded and they get trampled down by the nations. Now, some think that this refers literally to a destruction of Jerusalem that happened in the past or will happen in the future. But more likely, John's following the tradition of Jesus and the apostles who all used the new temple as a symbol for God's new covenant people. In that case, this is an image about how Jesus' followers may suffer persecution by the nations, but this external defeat cannot take away their victory through the Lamb. 
This idea gets expanded in the scroll's second vision. God appoints two witnesses as prophetic representatives to the nations. And once again, some people think this refers literally to two prophets who will appear one day in the future. But John calls them lampstands, which is one of his clear symbols for the churches. So this vision is more likely about the prophetic role of Jesus' followers, who are to take up the mantle of Moses and Elijah and call idolatrous nations and rulers to turn back to the one true God. But then, all of a sudden, a horrible beast appears. Let the reader remember Daniel chapter 7, and the beast conquers the witnesses and kills them. But then, God brings them back to life and vindicates the witnesses before their persecutors, and the end result is that many among the nations finally do repent and give glory to the Creator God in the day of the Lord. Now, stop. Think about the story so far. God's warning judgments through the seals and through the trumpets did not generate repentance among the nations, just like the Exodus plagues only hardened Pharaoh's heart. But the lamb, he conquered his enemies by loving them, dying for them. And now the message of the lamb's scroll reveals the mission of his army, the church. God's kingdom will be revealed when the nations see the church imitating the loving sacrifice of the lamb, not killing their enemies, but dying for them. It is God's mercy shown through Jesus' followers that will bring the nations to repentance. And this surprising claim is the message of the open scroll that John has placed at the exact center of the entire book. After this, the last trumpet sounds and the nations are shaken as God's kingdom comes here on earth as it is in heaven. So now we know how the church will bear witness to the nations and inherit the new creation, but who was that terrible beast that waged war on God's people? And how will the whole story turn out? John will tell us in the second half of the book of the Revelation. Revelation. Revelation 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. For the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, 
Fear not. I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Revelation 2 To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works and I will strike her children dead, 
and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation 3 And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, 
as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation 4 After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal, and around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, and is, and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne, and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Revelation 5 Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, 
To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped.